This is a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hi there. I'm here today with Dave Kaufman from Dave Kaufman's Reptile Adventures. Hey guys. Which is definitely one of my very favorite channels on YouTube. Uh, I've been talking to Dave for well over a year now, oh, yeah. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, easy. Uh, you know, dreaming of this day. And, and Thank you. This is, a, this is a very special edition of Rad Facts because today we're gonna talk about Rad Facts about Bearded dragons. You may recognize Letty, who is named after the bearded woman from The Greatest Showman, uh, from some of our other videos, like our full video on bearded dragons, which is right there, uh, and also our top five for beginners. And she just shows up from time to time, our head to head with bearded dragons and anything else. Uh, usually she's looking a little more robust than this, but she just laid five clutches of eggs and I'm, I'm cutting her some slack. I should mention, in my entire life, I have never been to where bearded dragons live. I have seen two species of bearded dragons, this one and one other that we will discuss today, and that's it. Dave, on the other hand, has the job that somebody has to do, which is to travel the world and go see all the coolest things oh, that possibly job, exist in the world of reptiles. Yes, you, you are a public <laughs> servant, and we thank you all for taking on this terribly undesirable job. Wow. And not very long ago, he went to Australia to study bearded dragons in the wild and the way they're living and to compare that to the way that we keep them. He's, he's studied uh, the other, there, there are eight or nine species nine of bearded species. dragons. And we have two here in the United States. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. I'm here essentially to pick Dave's brain about bearded dragons. Bearded dragons, they are the quintessential pet. You know, they are probably, aside from maybe leopard geckos, they are the most popular pet lizard in the world. Japanese herpers love them. The, uh, the European herpers love them. You know, even the South American herpers, which, you know, there's not a lot, but they know and love the bearded dragons. And of course, in Australia, you know, they're producing bearded dragon morphs that we just simply probably will never get over here um, because of the import-export laws that Australia has. Can I tell you about some of my know in the United States? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, so there's just sort of the regular wild type, and then there are a lot of them that are like polygenic ones, like citrus and stuff, where they're right. just brighter and brighter, and tiger, where they're striped. But some true morphs, there's one called a zero, mm -hmm. and there's one called a Whitbits. And those are both like probably some sort of form of leucism, both of them. The Whitbits is I a little bit more silver. This The zero is kind of almost a white. And then uh, you've got a lot of scalation morphs. There's the right. silk back, which is a b virtually right. scaleless, and and it's incomplete dominant with the wild type. So when you when you get a heterozygote, you get leather backs. Right. And there's a couple. There's an Italian leather back and like an American leather back, and then there's another one where the scales grow really funny, and it's escaping my mind. Micro scale. Well, there's micro scale, but there's one where the scales look almost normal, but they come in at a. F oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. What is that one? Uh -huh. The dunners that have the weird backward scales. Yes. Hypos, and then there are translucents. There's translucent, right? Which have right. black eyes. So we we've, we've got a fair number, and then and then you mention that there are other morphs. I'm like, right. Wow. Right, right. And then there's the whole red complex, the sandfire oh, complex. Oh yeah. So yeah, I mean there are just tons and tons of morphs of the central bearded dragon, and the mm -hmm. central bearded dragon is the one that is the most popular around the world. So of the nine uh, species of bearded dragon, this guy is a central, mm -hmm. and they're called central because they are found in what's called the red center, which is the center of Australia. So, central bearded dragon. This is Pagona viticeps, correct? Correct, yes. Um, and then you go into the east coast of Australia and you get into the eastern bearded dragons and they are much more longer bodied. Yeah, their nose they're, is really long. Yeah, and they have really long noses and they're really, they're really thin. I mean, to look at these guys from what we know about these big chunky monkeys like this, you know, to look at an eastern, you're like, my God, that thing is so thin. But the easterns, they're kind of like, almost javelin 
bearded dragons. Yeah, like like if you took a bearded dragon and stretched it out. Right, exactly. I love it. Right, and what so a great description. There, there are a love. few bearded dragon uh, breeders in the United States working with Easterns. Really? There are. They're really, really hard to find. Did they come from Europe? Uh, yeah, all bearded dragons came in, came out of Australia, some legally, some not legally, uh, but they went through Europe. How many species do they have in Europe? That's a very good question. Uh, there's, a, there's, uh, you know, like the pygmy bearded dragons. I don't Rankins think that or, they have. No, no, oh, oh, Rankin, Rankins There's a and smaller pygmy. than the Rankins? Yes, yep, yep, yep. Neat. There's a lot of confusion over what is what, really. Um, but some people call the Rankins pygmies. Some yep, people call, it. you know, the smaller one pygmies. It all depends on where in the world you are and what super they're being pygmies, called. Super pygmies, we'll call them. Super pygmies. Yes. Australian super pygmies. There, we just dubbed it right here, right now. <laughs> you heard it. Therefore, we are not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so the Rankin's dragon, which is, you know, the smaller of the one that's most commonly yep. kept. That's the only other species I've seen in yep. person. Yep. And they are, they're cute little buggers. Oh, I love them. But with the Rankin's dragon, there's a story behind the name Rankin. And they're named after uh, Peter Rankin. Okay, because I was curious, because their, their scientific name is Henry Lawson. Right, right. And that's not somebody named Peter Rankin. That's correct. So... Here's the story behind this. Uh, Peter Rankin was a very talented Australian uh, herpetologist, a very young one. And uh, right after he graduated with his degree in herpetology, he went from Australia to New Caledonia to go study the crested geckos and the uh, Lichianus geckos, the giant geckos, as I did. When he was there, he saw a Lichianus up in a tree, and he climbed that tree and slipped and fell to his death and he was 23 years old, and he was a very, very talented herpetologist who had an enormous career. I mean, the things that he could have brought to our collective knowledge of these reptiles, him falling out of that tree and dying on New Caledonia robbed our entire culture of so much. So the Rankin dragon is named after Peter Rankin, and there's also a gecko on New Caledonia named after him, and there's a, I wanna say skink in Australia named after him. All right, so Henry Lawson, I, so it's Bogona, Henry Lawson, I is the scientific on it. Henry Lawson was Australia's po uh, kind of poet laureate. He was a very famous poet in Australia, uh, akin to our Longfellow. He happened to, I mean, he made a career out of just traveling around the outback, writing poems about Australia, and he became kind so of So he this, was you with poetry. Exactly right. So he became kind of this, you know, folk hero in Australia. And as a matter of fact, Henry Lawson's face is on one of their dollars. I think the $5 bill, $10 bill. Wow. Somebody in Australia is watching. Comment below, which, which, which dollar bill is, is Henry <laughs> Lawson? I can't remember. He just happened to write a poem either about a bearded dragon that he saw in the wild, or he mentioned a bearded dragon in it. And so while they named, you know, the pygmy bearded dragon, or, you know, if that's the pygmy, or if this is the pygmy, whatever. Not, not the super pygmy. Not the super pygmy. Not the Australian super pygmy. Super, super pygmy. <laughs> super duper pygmy. Um, but yeah, so they, they, they took the Rankin's dragon and they named it after Peter Rankin, and then uh, the scientific name they gave to this poet in Australia. And that's where the names come from. So we've talked about three species so far. Mm -hmm. Have you been around any of the others? Well, four, we've talked about four. Can we talk about the, the super yes, duper yes. hyper mega yes. dwarf bearded yes. dragon? We've talked about just the regular dwarf bearded dragon or the Rankin's dragon. Rankin's, yeah. We've talked about and the Gonoviticeps, the yep. central. We've talked about and, the eastern. Right. And those are the common ones. And, you know, I encourage all of you guys to go on Google and do your own research as to what these nine you know, species of bearded dragon were. And, uh, you know, also comment below and let us know if you guys knew that there were nine different species oh, yeah. of bearded dragon. I'd be very interested to see how many of us knew about that. I didn't until I actually went over to Australia, so. Bearded dragons are smart. And I've, I've talked before about humans, how humans are very, um, how we're not so good at assessing the intelligence of other animals because we usually assess them on how well they do human things. But bearded dragons communicate with each other very clearly. And I, they're called yes, bearded they dragons because they've got a big beard that they actually will often turn black and they puff it up and they use that to signal their intentions to other dragons, either aggression or an intention to mate. And, and they accompany this with a lot of head bobbing and waving. Waving is usually a submissive thing that, you know, if somebody else comes up and they're 
bobbing at you and you don't want to fight, you signal that you don't want to fight by waving. Right. I have one one female who would signal that she didn't want to fight with two hand waving and she's only got three legs. So she was holding <laughs> on with just one leg and doing two handed waving to signal how much she didn't want to. It's almost like, stuff. no beef. Yes, no, I don't want any trouble. I don't want to beef. And right. if you do, then you bob yeah, yeah, right yeah, back, yeah, and then back. it's on, and you get all sideways, and you puff <laughs> yourself up. And uh, something that's really cool, there's a 2015 study about how bearded dragons can learn behaviors by observing other dragons. And what they did is they, they had these special cages that had a lever that they needed to hit in order to open up a door that had food behind it. And what they found was that they could put bearded dragons in this cage and they would never ever figure out how to open up mm -hmm, this right. door. But they trained a few bearded dragons to be able to open the doors. And, and then they could eventually do it. Well, they allowed other bearded dragons to observe the trained bearded dragons opening the doors and they would put them in study. and they would go open the doors and get the food out and it is amazing that is that kind of behavior is something we have observed in almost like birds and and mammals and that's maybe octopus right which octopus are so weird because they don't even live very long and they're super not social and yet they and can they still learn from watching each other intelligent but bearded dragons one of the first reptiles we've ever observed anything like this and you know and, and probably some of it is that they're smart and some of it too is that they're very social there's a there's a major social hierarchy and and observing other dragons is a really important part of the life of a bearded dragon but anyway that's just yeah one of no my they favorite are incredibly in intelligent and you know you always hear the reptilian brain as if it's some pea brain that only allows for motor function and I need to eat, I need to sleep, and I need to breed. And it, it's not that. It's not that at all. Mm -hmm. So we need to rethink about how intelligent reptiles are because they are it, more intelligent than we've ever given them credit for, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. So when I was in Australia and I was filming uh, the episode Bearded Dragons in the Wild, are we keeping them correctly? One of the things that I discovered is that, you know, we, we talk about that bearded dragons need really high UV light. And they do. I mean, they are sun-loving lizards, but it was thought that especially the central bearded dragon was completely diurnal, completely go inactive at night. And what we discovered was that was not true. So we were road cruising at night looking for geckos or, you know, uh, carpet pythons or whatever it was that we were looking for. And lo and behold, there were bearded dragons, central bearded dragons out on the road, hunting at night, you know, crossing the road. They were road cruising too. They were, they were road cruising too. They were, ro they were humaning. We yeah. were herping, they were humaning. <laughs> um, but, you know, they are active at night. So that blows away the, the thought that, you know, these animals are strictly diurnal and they're not. So when I was in the Red Center, which is, you know, also known as the outback of Australia, uh, and talking about how red bearded dragons are found on red soil and brown and yellow bearded dragons are found on brown and yellow soil out in the outback, um, what I did notice, and it's so controversial, is I wanted to pay very close attention on what kind of natural substrate I was witnessing bearded dragons hanging out on. That's really cool. And they were absolutely living and hunting and spending most of their time on sand. And I know that this is a really, really controversial subject. You know, there, there is a major difference between what these bearded dragons are doing in the wild and what these domestic ones are doing and how they should be kept. If they're living on sand in the wild, they can run to another substrate and get away from that sand. But if they ingest that sand in the wild, which I'm sure that they do, it doesn't mm. affect them the way that we fear that it's going to affect them in, in our domestic situation. So, mm. you know, it's a conversation that's going to go on and on and on. What is the best substrate for bearded dragons? Is it sand? Is it clay? Is it tiles? Is it newspaper? And the answer is there is no answer. Yep. The answer is that there isn't one best substrate, even though in the wild they are living on sand. And I think I even said this in my video that you should actually have two different kinds of substrate in your enclosure so that they have a choice. That's a good approach. Yep. Yep. Good solution. And uh, you know, I talk. And you can feed them off of the sand. Absolutely. Which is absolutely that's a great solution. Right. right. But oh, that is that is so such good information. You know, I, I've definitely found. On most animals, I don't recommend sand at all. But on adult bearded dragons, right. 
it's it seems to be in a lot of ways the best substrate, right. but there are those risks, and I like I like the way that you you talked about that you right. can minimize those risks, right, and, and give them an option as well. Exactly, and that's great. What, what you were talking about as far as them being nocturnal, or partial, not totally yeah. diurnal, and but this was also I might say this was in March, so this mm -hmm. is at the very this is our August. Which you know, makes perfect sense right. because they're getting escaping the heat of the day. They, right, their summer is our winter, vice versa. So this was at the end of the Australian summer, where it was you know 165 degrees ground temperature in the sun, and so yeah, they that is way they're probably too down hot. Down in a hole. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. They're in crevices where it's about 90 to 100 degrees. Um, and uh, waiting and for the geckos at night. Exactly right. And then they come out and they shift their habits to become nocturnal in those really, really hot months. All the species of bearded dragons are in the family Agamidae, which includes a lot of the coolest lizards on the planet. And something that I love about the Agamids, generally, not all of them, generally, is that they don't drop their tails. Yeah, that's which true. Which is magical. That's true. And if they do, they're not going to grow up back. No, no, that is, they might cap it off, but that's right, not right, all you get. Right, you get a stump. They're also in the subfamily Amphibolurinae which I may be saying completely wrong, and feel free to correct me. The only reason that I even mention that, because uh, I am not much of one to be interested in Linnaean taxonomy, but this is a really cool subfamily because it's it's kind of all the coolest agamid lizards that exist. That is you know, true. It's, it's your bearded dragons, but it's also your water dragons, including your Chinese water dragon. Right. It's your frilled dragons. It's your thorny devils. And I want to bring them up. Thorny devil is probably the coolest looking lizard in the it world. It is amazing. This whole group are the bearded dragons. This is a common name, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it actually has some standardization to it in that the agamid lizards are pretty much all called dragon as a common name. It, we've got things like the Komodo dragon, which are not agamid lizards, but most True. most lizards that we call dragons, they're agamid lizards, and then the bearded dragon, and surprisingly, it's because they've got that beard they can That's pop right. up. So it's a, it's a common name that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Generally speaking, if it's called dragon, it's probably an agamid, but that doesn't mean that all the agamids are called uh, dragons. Uh, dragons. And you, you were telling me exactly which ones right. are. Right, so like red-headed agamas and... Clown uh, agamas. Right, yeah, so some of the aga uh, agamas in the Middle East and Africa are not called dragons, but there are other lizards uh, outside of this family in Australia that are called dragons. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, the central netted dragon, which are these cute little dudes about that big with big long tails. Um, so the dragon as a family is an actual family of lizards in Australia. I'm drawing a huge blank on sailfin dragons, though. That's yep. that's an Asian that's a dragon, dragon. Right, from Southeast Asia. So there's right common names. There's no real rhyme right. or reason. Right. All lizards are dragons, but not all dragons are lizards. Unless it's the winged variety. Uh, okay. Another just totally rad nerd fact. But bearded dragons are. Often, you know, and sometimes you get this about all squamate reptiles, but bearded dragons have a rudimentary venom gland. And their bite, you know, as I understand it, you know, it's not, it's not medically significant to humans. I'm more not worried about their teeth than their saliva. But their saliva, I think, can cause some irritation as well. A little bit. So this is a question that is going to go on through the ages. Mm -hmm. What is venomous and what is not venomous. Yes. There are we're arguably venomous. And that's exactly right. So there are there is, you know, a thought that if you have a paroided gland, you are venomous. We have two of them right here on our upper lip. So we are technically venomous. But what is the strength of the venom? Mm -hmm. You know, which is an important question. Right. You watch a garter snake take down a wiggling fish before that fish is swallowed, that fish all of a sudden stops moving suggesting that the fish was susceptible to the garter snake's venom, mm -hmm. but if he bites us, nothing happens. So it all has to do with the toxicity and the proteins and the enzymes within that saliva that makes up what is dangerously venomous and what is not dangerously and venomous. And this is definitely not a dangerously venomous right. lizard. I should mention too, Bearded dragons lay a heck of a lot of eggs. They do. The, this is Letty, and she's she's my female bearded dragon, and she's looking a little skinny these days because she just laid her fifth clutch of, of eggs this season. She's laid right in the neighborhood of 100 eggs. That is insanely fecund, 
And it probably speaks a lot to the danger that these guys do encounter, at least as juveniles, because that's a lot of babies per female. That is a lot of babies per female. And these are pretty common within their range mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, whereas other reptiles like sea turtles, they just have oodles and oodles of eggs, it's thought that one or two of those actually make it to adulthood. And in the wild, you know, obviously, if let's say she did lay a hundred eggs on the dot, well, maybe 10 of those eggs, maybe 20 of those eggs, if she's lucky, are gonna make it to adulthood. And that's why, you know, obviously they lay a lot of eggs. In captivity, of course, every one of those eggs, if it's viable, is going to hatch. Yep, so, it's insane. You know, as far as brumation is concerned for these guys, you know, I, I hear a lot of different things as to what's going on and how people are actually brumating them to get them receptive in the spring. Some people just shut them down to, you know, maybe 50 degrees. It does get that cold in the outback in the middle of winter. It actually snows in the outback, ice forms in the, in the outback. So it does get that cold even though it's a desert. There is significant evidence that they have temperature-dependent sex determination. That is that is what I have heard as well. I am really curious, you know, we know in wild sea turtles that th that exists. The gender of the offspring is not genetic, it is temperature-dependent. And colder generally means more males, warmer, more females. And I don't know that there's been a lot of studies about these guys in the wild with temperature determination. I would love to know. Yeah. Well, she sure is affectionate. She's the best. Look at this. Well, this beauty. has probably been the greatest episode ever of Rad Facts. Really? Oh, absolutely. It's because of the bearded dragon. Yeah, I'm sure that's the reason. <laughs> well, guys, now that you've learned a little bit more about bearded dragons, now it's my turn to film, and I'm going to film Clint and his favorite reptiles for my channel. So pop on over to Dave Kaufman's Reptile Adventures and be sure to hit that bell so you never miss an upload. I okay. may even show you guys the rest of the studio. Uh-oh. And we want to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon, and as our way of saying thank you, those of you that are already uh, supporting us on Patreon know that we have an extra segment called Patreon Extras. And these are these are clips that you know usually are a little bit more spontaneous and fun, and there's a lot of cool facts and information, and just times when we were answering questions and conversing, and and, and funny moments that that didn't make it into our full video. This video, I can tell you having just filmed it, is gonna be full of amazing content for Patreon extras, so please support us on Patreon and, and check out that video as well. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. And as I say on my channel, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle, rattle on. on. <laughs> yeah, right. I like it. Oh my God, I'm such a geek. Amphilibu, you're gonna say that. Amph, Amphibolurinae, Amphibol, Amphibolurinae. They're in the subfamily, subfamily, now I can't talk at all. Amphibolurinae. I may be saying that completely wrong. Amphibolurinae. Amphibolurinae. Sounds like we've been at the pub. A two-legged dragon with wings. Oh, a No front legs. There it is. There it is. I is want some, one of those. I, that, that is a piece of trivial knowledge I have never been able to employ in my entire life. Javelin. Where are you going? I'm heading out. Bye bye. That'd be great. You want to do this? We can do it in everyone. Do it. All right. Well put. I couldn't agree more. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> you run into an extinction scenario. Yep. And. One rule, Clint. We have yeah. one rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that one? Normally, I don't struggle with it. So We're much. professionals. Professional. <laughs>